the Thoughty OT podcast. Perhaps understand what what you think the benefits of having pets are to like specifically autistic people. Like, I mean, oh, you, you could really, maybe not really spe- good question. just specifically, but if there are some specific ones, maybe mention them. But obviously, like I can imagine the sort of yeah. I'll drop some big ones for you. Yeah. So I've actually been reading uh, in research in preparation for an upcoming video. I'm sorry to keep pimping this, but this is absolutely uh, super fascinating to me. And it's like the number, number two question. <laughs> so, and it's about um, how autistic people gravitate towards non-human uh, animals. So we're all animals get out mm. of the way. But like, if you've got like cats, dogs, for example, companion animals, how much extra value people who are on the spectrum gain out of that compared to neurotypicals. That's the first thing. There's a, there's a certain, unfortunately, reading a lot of these studies, there's a lot of, uh, it's called like human replacement or people replacement. And it's a bizarre kind of concept. It's this othering language of, oh, they pre- oh look at Mike over there. He prefers cats to people. And it's like, well, yes, but I'm not replacing people with cats. It's not like I want an army of people around me. I'm just going to replace them all with cats. That's not it's not where we're going with it. Sure. It's just that we um, we uh, get a lot of what we could gain out of social relationships with other humans from companion animals as well. Mm-hmm. And that's just not mammals, but, you know, that can be fish. It can be your bearded dragons and reptiles and things as well. But we get an awful lot out of that. And there's an awful lot of uh, benefits that autistic people can gain from it being a fulfillment of a ritual. So it's really kind of hard to explain, but the, yeah. the act of caring for animals like you've got like a routine in the morning so for example we have a routine for feeding the birds it involves just chucking them out a load of corn it's a really simple routine it's very kind of medieval you get a bucket you get the corn you pick it up and just flick it on there and you're done right that's them done and it's like there is something kind of like really peaceful about that and really kind of like you know it's like a life goal just a bucket of corn and chickens and you just chuck corn out for birds it's just like it's very peaceful and it's really rewarding so it's like on on one hand, it can be hard to actually get yourself into into a, an actual routine. But on the other hand, once you are in it and you have that routine a part of your day, it's kind of like a nice thing. I also think that it's kind of almost a grounding thing. So another example is I will forget to feed myself, but the cats won't let me forget to feed them. Sure. So if the, if the machines are not there for the cats to, to feed them or they're empty or whatever, they will not let you sleep. They won't let you rest. They will bother you really badly <laughs> to feed them. Then once you're in that zone of like feeding the cats, it's then like, maybe I should make myself a sandwich or yes, like some cereal yeah. as well. So it like reminds it's, you to kickstart other parts of your routine. Kind of. Yeah, exactly, Thomas. Thank you so much. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. So like the routine that goes along with the animal husbandry does kind of connect in with the routines that you need to follow through as, as a human as well. That makes that's, sense. Re- that's really cool. Yeah. We also get really good sort of like stimmy value from them as well. So one of them wants to come in. I've got I've got Emma here, and Emma's kind of like she's pretty neurospicy, um, <laughs> but they're great to see. That you know they they feel good. They're purring away. You know, if you're lying down on a bed with like ten cats on you, it's it's a fantastic experience. It's like a weighted blanket, a heated blanket, and like a stim toys all in one. Yes. There's, you know, so there's kind of like that element of it as well. So there's kind of like the physical sensory kind of element then there is a flip side as well um things like litter trays and whatnot and we've got some unique ways i think of managing that like um how, how are we doing in the chat by the way <laughs> yeah okay, i think we're doing good we're maybe maybe we'll read out a couple of a couple of things <laughs> um renee says my cats generally just steal covers or the best part of the pillow <laughs> <laughs> um Isabella says two of my favorite people doing a podcast. <laughs> oh, thank you, Isabella. Yeah. Uh autistic couple, I'll answer that one. Uh, where is Mike, everyone? Did he say Malaysia? No, my mother's uh Malaysian. I'm on a place called the Isle of Man. Uh the Isle of Man is a little island in the Irish Sea. Um It's not I'm just not know. just men there, though, is it? It's not like a <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly women over here, I'm afraid. Oh, I can uh, see a cat there. Yeah, so this is this is Emma, and, and she's at her she's at her bowl. But we're on we're on the wrong stream, Emma. This is not this is not the super chat stream. <laughs> you see, I I actually um oh. <laughs> I'll have to. Sorry, Thomas. Anyway. It's so good. I actually um. 
Okay, there we go. I for for a long time, I think it was probably because of my my grandma because she has like a a really crippling phobia of cats. Um, she oh, has no. she has this story of like how one sort of summer day, um, sort of a group of cats sort of climbed in through like a small window in in one of her apartments and um, like stole like stole they like stole it like an entire. <laughs> Sort of Easter egg or something, and, uh, and <gasps> apparently that that scarred her for yeah. for life. <laughs> she doesn't like cats, okay. um, but that kind of <laughs> that kind of rubbed off on me a little bit for a while. So I, I I've always been like a very much like a dog person, but when I went okay. to Thailand, um, basically like. I think probably probably about for three or four nights a week I'd go to this Taekwondo center. It was this um, sort of Thai team. Ch- Chiang Mai was the place, kind of in the north of Thailand. And after every session, I would sort of sit on the mats and do some stretches and stuff. And there was always this one cat that would just come up to me and just like sit, like sit between my legs while I was like stretching and. Um, I got I got chosen by the cat and I was I was like I'm trying very very hard not to like you but it's getting more difficult and I I kind of kind of got a little bit of a bond with them and I was like hmm maybe I should change my perspective. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe Thomas. I mean, you're not a million miles from me. You should perhaps you should perhaps visit and we'll see if we can sort of win you over with the cats. But we have dogs as well. I like them now. So, I like them now. Yeah. The dogs and you can kind of stay for the cats. So. Got a few cats. Sorry. <laughs> this is Saber. Got another, <laughs> one. Familiar with that. <laughs> another one. Yeah, there's there's quite a few in here at the minute. <laughs> Let me know if the audio is a problem, guys. <laughs> Daniel Daniel says um, cats get confused around gingers. Cats steal st- steal souls, but gingers have no <laughs> souls. It's a conundrum. Well, there is a that ginger cats <laughs> their one brain. Uh, I cannot, I cannot confirm or deny if this is true. <laughs> Probably <laughs> true. <laughs> I can, I can. Well, I don't know. It's it's quite hard to sort of determine if someone has a soul by looking at them. But I'd, I'd assume that the the follicles on someone's head does not determine the the um, mm. the encapsul- encapsulation. What am I trying to say? <laughs> The the con- the containment of a soul, I would say probably. <laughs> that was a little bit Ghostbusters. <laughs> well, um, you need a cat. <laughs> I I would definitely like, like say say for me when it comes to like the benefits of sort of pets. Like as as I said, I've only really had a dog, and it wasn't really looked after by me. But my first dog, he was from the kennel. Um, he was called Bob. We we quite often called him Bobby Dog, of course. Um, and he was like, um, he had like a midnight coat, midnight eyes. We got him from, my parents got him from the kennel, like about a year before I was born as a puppy. And, um, he was basically my big brother. And I think he lived until about the age of about 14, 15. So it was, it was a large part of my life for a long time. And I do remember sort of coming home from, from days at school and sort of like cuddling with him at the top of the staircase and yeah i don't know it's um it kind of i don't yeah it's it's kind of like a, like an unspeakable bond I, I don't really know how to describe it very much but it was a, it was a big part of of my life for a long time um still haven't really got over him to be honest <laughs> but it's, oh, dude. Like, you know, like, I don't think you do, and it is, it is actually the worst thing. And sometimes I find myself getting into thought spirals where I'll be, like, you know, cuddling onto the cats, presumably, and, and I'll be, like, imagining, like, when they're going to die or something. Oh. And i be stressing myself out about it. And this sounds kind of ridiculous, and I know it's a human thing, but I do get pretty sad, and then I'll find myself getting quite sort of anxious and upset um, about it. Um and and it's like you know like mourning them before they've gone or even afterwards it's like to a degree it's healthy but and the net sum it's not like an equal sum game of like the amount of joy you get is all got to be repaid with some sadness as well 
Um, and it is hard. I, I completely understand that. Um, in a weird sort of way, I said I had 21 cats and, you know, the average mean age of that was about 18. So, wow. you know, um, a long period. I mean, I think I was 35 before I lost my first cat, um, you know, my first pet. So it was kind of like quite a hard thing to to kind of go through and then, think, you know, quite a few in order. I think it definitely does like highlight sort of the fragi fragility of, of life. Like that was kind of like my first experience with like having it, having a death, you know, in, 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 around me rather, um, which was really hard. Of course. I mean, my parents said that it just kind of ran up, ran off somewhere, but you know, that's just like what parents say, but, um, Maybe it's, true. <laughs> it's, but it, it really, I don't know. It kind of, I suppose prepared me for like, the nature the nature of what like life is like and you know the the sort of subtleties of um like the value that each day has with somebody or a, or a pet or um no. i remember it hit, it hit me quite hard even though i was quite young no it, well, especially because you were quite young i think um and i think it's like it's quite it's, I mean, I mean, life is difficult and you don't know when, and I don't mean, it's not, not in a morbid way, but you don't know when the last time you'll speak to someone will be or when the last time you'll, you'll see someone. So kind of, it is a reminder. It's a very cognizant reminder of kind of taking each day hmm. on its own, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's well understood anyway that, that pets help with, with anxiety um i know folks from the army that have ptsd service dogs uh and it's i worry about them not having the dog anymore you know it's kind yeah. of like quick yeah. we need one we need, to, we need to like succession plan these dogs and like encourage them to get another one because their service dogs getting a bit old you know because it's because it gives them so much hope and it gives them so much hope is the wrong term actually uh relief might be mm. a better one mm. comfort might be it's hard to pick the right word um but you know it's like even when they can't care for themselves, they can for their service animal, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, Cause that is, I guess, another thing that that's talked about a lot when it comes to like autism and pets, cause you can get autism sort of support dogs and things that are like, I had interviewed um, uh, or Ella on the podcast, I yeah, think okay. probably sometime within season two, we were talking about their so service dog. Coco, how they help mm -hmm. with like meltdowns and stuff like that. I thought yeah, that was really interesting. And also to kind of position themselves between you and other people to kind of give you just that, just that space mm. that perhaps you might not be aware of yourself. Like I think bubble. there's so much to a bubble, yeah. And and dogs are great at that. Um, that almost comes naturally to them, perhaps even more than perhaps a blind person service dog would be. But I don't, um, short of the other content creators, I don't know anyone with um, an autism service animal. But I do know a lot of autistic people with companion animals. Yes, yeah. In fact, um, in fact, I can see from even in this chat, there's quite a few people with like their pets as profile pictures. And, mm. and I noticed that quite a lot on my own live streams. Um, people have also emailed me pictures of their pets. I've got an email inbox full of photographs of people's pets. I wow. encourage you to send pictures of their pets. I really enjoy uh, you know, people send me pictures of their cats and their dogs and their fish and all sorts of stuff, rabbits and uh, reptiles and lizards. And um, I think it's fantastic. It's a great way to bond with other people. Um, the friends that I have uh, in real life, as it were, IRL. I mean, Thomas, you're a friend in real life, but you know what I mean? Like in IRL, you know, like geographically nearby. Yeah. Um, I've, I've all come, broadly speaking, from either my work with marine and environment stuff or pets. Mm. so it's kind of like like even having pets kind of brings you closer to other people in a good way like if you walk a dog if i walk Maisie, uh in fact she doesn't get walked as much as she should because people want to talk to me all the time they go oh such a cute dog how old is she what's her name <laughs> you know and it's, like, and it's like okay 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 at least it's a script but it's like please i just want to walk my dog <laughs> yeah i think <laughs> i think purple ella was talking about that too like with, as it being like a it's kind of nice because you get a past yeah. towards people but also like sometimes you just don't want to you can't be asked with it like 